Hi there, I'm Nicole Wilbur. I'm a writer and story nerd, and today we are story nerding the hell out. So 12 days ago, yes, 12 days ago, Sony Pictures put the first episode of the pilot episode, I guess, of Pan Am on their YouTube channel. It now has over a million views and I am very excited about it. If you didn't know, Pan Am was a TV show in 2011, 2012. 2011, 2012 was the time of amazing TV shows that only got one season. I don't know if it was like the Netflix effect was happening by then or what, but there was Pan Am, there was Terra Nova, there was Off the Map. These truly excellent shows all canceled. It was very exciting. And I was like just chilling today. I decided to watch it. And then I had to stop a couple minutes in and go, my story brain is going crazy. And I had to sit and analyze it all. So that is what we are going to do in this video. We are going to analyze Pan Am. Um, and this is going to kind of, we're, we're going to be focusing on the scene weave and the plot threads. Some of the later chapters in that book talk about scene weave, scene order, and how to do a scene weave when you have a multi-strand plot. And all TV shows are multi-strand plots, for the most part, I think, because they deal with lots of different characters kind of all put together. Um, so I think a multi-strand could also be called like a plot archetype if you're talking in Brandon Sanderson language, a plot thread, a story thread, a narrative thread, whatever you want to call it. That's what we're calling it here. Uh, we are So we are going to analyze this by tracking the plot threads and how they are woven together through this scene weave. It's going to be something like, um, what chapter? It's gonna be something like that chapter of Anatomy of Story where he does that. Cool. And then at the end, we're gonna talk over the structure steps for each of the plot archetypes. The first part though, we have to do all of the setup. And so I have analyzed um, the first 10 minutes of the pilot and then we're gonna get more summary wise once we've set up all of the plot threads. But the first 10 minutes of this pilot are so good and they use so many strategies that I think are genius. And so we're gonna talk about it in depth. You can watch this as a commentary. So I'm going to have the, the episode playing for the first 10 minutes right here in front of me. So if you would also like to watch the first 10 minutes of the episode while I provide the commentary for you, this is a dream of mine. I used to love that track on the DVD. Did you ever watch those, the, like, the special features on the DVD? It was my favorite part. And the fact that we don't have those anymore just like breaks my heart. Like Netflix needs to have a special features. They just have to. Where's the commentary? Come on. Anyways, I'm going to be doing a commentary of the first 10 minutes. I will count down um, to when I press play and then we will talk it through. After that, we were going to go through act by act, plot thread by plot thread, talk about how they are advanced, do a little summary. It's going to be great. So I am at zero seconds, zero, 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 zero on the Pan Am thing. I'm linking it below and I am going to press play. In three, two, one, there we go. So we start with the setting. There is the little title on the bottom, New York 1963. And the first couple minutes of this are really about giving us a time and a place. So the music is first of all kind of like inspirational and then it gets very into kind of like the, the time period. Um, the really cool part is that we're at an airport and we have this little boy get a smile from the pilot. He looks at the pilot in awe. He's so excited. And then we're in the airport. We're seeing what this New York airport is like in 63. It's kind of sunrise. Um, we see people like checking their luggage. There's no security because this is very pre 9-11. It's very exciting. And so then what happens is very soon we're gonna see the Life Magazine. So we see the Life Magazine being brought through the airport and we get a little bit of exposition in the form of the stewardesses reading the magazine out loud. They kind of say, you know, who stewardesses are. They're college educated, they fly until they're married. Um, but it's still interesting exposition because next second we're looking at the girl on the cover. 
And we get a really interesting bit of conflict here. This is between Laura and the lady who's stopping her. She's kind of critical. There's a power dynamic. Um, the lady has more power, even though Laura was on this cover. She like smacks her to check for the girdle, which is completely ridiculous. Um, Laura is clearly in the power poor position here. She's new, she's intimidated, and it's interesting because that being on that cover is disruptive to the power dynamic. And all Laura, poor Laura wants is different stockings. And finally, Colette runs in, saves her, and kind of restores Laura's importance a little bit. So this bit where they're just kind of like walking through the hallway, this is about giving a little bit of that power back to Laura. And this is where we get our first curiosity seed. Laura has been at Pan Am for three weeks and two days. How the hell did she get on the cover of Life Magazine as a Pan Am stewardess? And we hear Colette say this, when did they pick you? How did it happen? And Laura, Margot Robbie says, I'm not sure exactly. And that's a curiosity seed because how is she not sure? Curiosity seed two is right there as Kate looks over as Laura walks past. Um, she kind of gives a look, it seems kind of jealous. And then we see Laura talking to the other stewardesses and Kate comes over and she's kind of like, trust her, she's not looking for a husband. There's clear tension. Kate tries to kind of resolve it and be nice. Um, Laura comes over and apologizes. It's a very much a curiosity seed is what is the relationship between these two, what's going on. You see that Kate is very much an insider. Even though Laura is like the famous one, Kate comes over and offers to bring gum and it's kind of obvious she's around her friends. Laura is the newbie, uncomfy, unsure, asking questions. We also get curiosity seed three, which is where is Bridget? Then we get to the bit where Kate is buying the gum and this dude comes over and they have a little interaction. It's pretty chill, you know, we get more of the tension on her looking at the Life magazine, I don't wanna buy it, you know. Very pretty girl, yeah, she's very pretty. There's more of that tension for curiosity seed number three about their relationship. And then we get the biggest revelation and notice this is about three minutes in. He says, are you ready for your first assignment? And that is a curiosity seed. This is our hook. Um, she has given her first assignment, which is to switch the man's visas. So he'll be detained at customs in London. She says, without him knowing, he says, I'll take that as rhetorical, which I think is funny. We know immediately she's doing something covert or illegal. And we get curiosity seed number four, which is who is Kate working for? And the major dramatic question, which is will Kate be able to switch these visas? And like, what's going on with this man? Um, the major dramatic question is, yeah, somewhat like that. Um, right after that, we go to Maggie, who's in this liberal kind of apartment, very different than the world we were just in, right? So, um, Maggie, you know, she's, she kind of, she wants to fly and the guy on the phone really, really wants her to fly. Um, and we get something really interesting set up here, even though Maggie is the kind of main character and her desire isn't really driving the scene. The fact that the guy is willing to send a helicopter to get her is huge, right? And that really ups the stakes. It shows us that this is not just a flight. This isn't just your normal flight. There are real massive stakes here and the scope of the story is much bigger than we thought. It's a promise to the viewer about what kind of story we are seeing here. And when the interesting thing she says, you know, sweetheart, wear the girdle, um, that bit is answers why Maggie was grounded and relates back to Laura. We have a tie in, ties back, makes things believable, closes things around. It's amazing. Then, of course, we have um, another bit on the curiosity seat about Bridget. He wants to know where she is. And finally, we get another little conflict thread set up as Colette sees John and is like, oh, he is about to be the guy from London. Notice we also have a bunch of dramatic irony happening here. We know Dean thinks that Bridget is gonna be the purser on the flight. We know that it's actually Margaret. That bit there where Kate says, smile through it, dear, that's important. It comes off as kind of catty. It's like adding to the tension. And then we have a successive um, cut, basically, of Maggie racing to the airport and the stewardess is getting the plane ready for takeoff. So we see some tension between Maggie and her roommate about sort of her motivation for seeing the world. This is really about understanding her character. She's kind of rebellious. She's more liberal. She doesn't fit with this girdle, girdle, girdle wearing situation. We then get Ted introduced. Ted is the first officer 
And Laura, who's our newbie, we love a newbie because the newbie asks questions. Grab your newbie, they're helpful. So Laura is like, who is he? Kate says, he's our co-pilot. Ted says, first officer, another little seed of tension and conflict. That is conflict thread D. I'm going to pause right here because I am a commercial. If you're not a commercial, maybe just pause. All through this section that started with Kate saying, smile through it, dear, we now have a clock. Now, a clock is usually introduced um, in TV shows and movies, like kind of later in the story to amp up the tension. For example, in Shonda Rhimes' Masterclass, she talks about a clock being introduced kind of in act three or four, right near the end, um, in order to get through it. And um, actually in both The Scandal and The Grey's Anatomy's pilots, someone literally said around act three, four, the clock is ticking fast, people. Here though, the clock is actually used at the very beginning. The clock is, this plane is taking off. We know the plane's gonna take off, and everyone's like getting ready for the takeoff. So we have Maggie rushing crazily across the city to get there, and we have the crew, we have the crew preparing for takeoff. This creates a ton of forward momentum in the story as all of our goals are being established. So we're setting up, right? We're setting up all of these conflicts, we're setting up all of these curiosity seeds. By the way, at this point, which is we're like five, six minutes in, all of the plot and conflict threads um, curiosity seeds, they've all been set up at this point for the entire rest of the episode. And major dramatic questions for the entire series have also been set up. And we'll get more into detail at the end of this 10 minutes. Um, but that is a lot to do, right? It's a lot to establish. It could be slow. But instead of being slow, they create a countdown, they create a clock. And even though like it's not a major question, like is Maggie going to make it? We think she is. It creates this like very exciting, sweeping excitement forward momentum. Okay, I'm gonna um, play my thing again. <laughs> oh, I got another ad. I'm so sorry, that sucks. Skipping ad, there we go. All right, we have Maggie in the taxi. We have some humor here where she's you know, changing. She tells the, the taxi driver eyes forward and we get a lot about her character. Um, Maggie doesn't have a big role in this, but she's really just building the character. She comes um, important. Then we get Dean arriving at the plane. Um, he kind of walks into the, co the cockpit and there's some teasing about him being nervous. Dean and Ted kind of joke around, you know, Dean says Pan Am wants actual pilots in the left seat. It's good natured teasing, but we can t see that it kind of is striking a nerve with Ted. We kind of see his like, ah, uh, look on his face when he's like, uh oh, that was like a, a joke, but it kind of, it kind of dug a little bit. We have here, um, Maggie is running and we see then the passengers slowly boarding the flight. So who do we have getting on? We have the target. So the person they're switching the visa with boards the flight here. Kate clocks that she's gonna have to do the swap. That's our conflict B. Um, and that first obstacle for her that this guy is not going to make it easy. He's going to not give his jacket. He's not gonna give her his briefcase. Um, that becomes very clear. And in immediately we know the intention, we know the obstacle. And in a few lines that is set up and she's like, oh God, here I go. This is gonna be difficult. We see Maggie get in a helicopter. Again, we're doing this cross cut here um, of her kind of just racing, keeping that excitement up of this being a big, a big deal. Then around eight minutes and five seconds, John rushes in to talk to Colette. She's happy to see him. And next moment in comes his wife. This is our first reversal, our first surprise, our first twist. This is our conflict C. It's a reveal, it's a quick twist right at the beginning. The long glance between them, we know exactly what's happening. We know exactly what the situation is. The wife is pleasant and unaware. We got her emotional state. We have our surprise, it's awesome. Maggie runs onto the plane. Um, at this point, she's getting through the airport. She's grabbing things and she slowly gets onto the plane. And when she gets on, everybody is surprised and confused because they thought Bridget was coming. But of course we knew, dramatic irony, we knew that it was Maggie the whole time. And that was also a source of tension for us as she was rushing to be there. We're like, oh, it's not who they think is coming. 
There's a blink and you'll miss it moment where Maggie expresses surprise, like, Dean, you're a captain now, question mark? And that gives a bit of fodder to conflict D, maybe a little bit of a curiosity seed, conflict D being between Ted and Dean. There will be a resource to follow along with this. They're kind of going back and forth, they're chatting, we get the banter, we get the crew dynamic, very nice. And we have, again, that kind of like, just maybe like life in the plane, life at the shop sort of thing. They're nice to each other. Then at 9.41, we get the answer to curiosity seed number two resolved. When Maggie looks at the register, she says, Laura Cameron, and Kate says, my sister. And suddenly we know the relationship between these two. Kate says, I can't seem to escape her. She shows the magazine and Maggie's like, wasn't that something? And you get a little bit of a vibe of like a, the sisters knew this is odd, this is a different scenario. You see Kate cover the Life magazine with a different one. You can see a bit of judgment. Everyone clearly thinks Laura was picked, doesn't think it's really necessarily fair. And um, that kind of goes back to our Kate versus Laura conflict. And then we see Dean, right at 10 minutes exactly, say clear for takeoff. This is the end of our clock. We are launching. We are launching the series. We are launching the plane. We get this moment of like real excitement, awe, and adventure. Dean and um, Ted look, look at each other. Everyone on the flight is kind of like looking around, peering. Colette's looking at John. Um, Kate's looking at her target. Maggie and Laura are sitting next to each other and Maggie says, um, you know, you're new, aren't you? And Laura is so nervous. And then Maggie says, better buckle up, adventure calls. And we get this huge moment of like excitement, grinning. We get the vibe of the period. We get sort of the underlying vibe of the story, which is we're gonna be exploring this like exciting, new, thrilling time where people are kind of just starting to travel, just starting to explore. These people are coming into their own. You know, this is a big thing for them. They grin, they take off, and we get the title card. Whew. Okay, people who do commentaries, I have no idea how. That was a lot of work. So that was the first 10 minutes. And in that first 10 minutes, they set up. Ahem. Let me read this for you. They set up one, two, four curiosity seeds and four conflict or plot threads. So a curiosity seed is basically like an information plot archetype. Um, so that kind of plays out. And then we have four actual plot lines or conflicts. There's probably like some smaller ones, but these are the major ones that I could see. They also not only planted eight things, but they also resolved one. So this, the seed of, um, why is Kate so jealous of Laura? Like their relationship seems weird. We got that answered. Kate is Laura's sister. And it's always a good idea, I think, in early in a story to resolve a curiosity seed because it gives the audience confidence that you are going to resolve your curiosity seeds and you're gonna give them answers and know what you're doing. So on my spreadsheet here, which I will link below and I might throw in a snapshot as well, I have the things all listed. So let's go over our, let's go over our seeds. So curiosity seed one is the Life Magazine picture. Laura said, I don't know how it happened. So that's weird. How do you not know how a picture happened? That's a question that we have. Seed two is what's the relationship between Laura and Kate? That's resolved, they're sisters. There's more there, but that will come up kind of in their conflict. Seed three, which is a big one, is where is Bridget? Seed four is what is Kate doing and why? Like. Who is she working for? Who is this guy? Like, what's going on? And then we get into the conflicts. So conflict A is, it's kind of like a Kate versus Laura. I wrote it down, but it's kind of also a performance story for Laura. Like, she's the newbie. She's trying to learn things. She's trying to do things well. And she's kind of failing at it. So their dynamic is right there. Conflict B is Kate's mission. She needs to swap those visas. Conflict C is Colette and John, and conflict D is um, Dean and Ted. So that gives us three continuing um, information plots. We have the Kate versus Laura being kind of like a status struggle, maybe a bit of performance in there. Conflict B, Kate's mission is very much action. It's kind of a golden fleece type template, type plot. You know, she has to do this thing. 
Conflict C is a love story plot. Um, there's also some status stuff in there. There's a lot of like power dynamics in this that are very interesting. And then finally, Conflict D, which I think is a pure like status struggle power dynamic. So in Act 2, we're going to touch on what happens in all of these threads. In Act 2, we, um, in terms of the Life magazine picture, we better position Laura as a newbie. She clearly is not comfortable. The other girls are doing this as it's like their bread and butter, right? They do it every day. Laura is clearly different. She's clearly newer. Um, she awkwardly interrupts these newlyweds. She's taking their picture. She's not sure what's going on, asking lots of questions. I love how Brandon Sanderson is like, I think it's in, the, in his heist, um, when he talks about the heist in his lectures and he's like, one beat is like, you grab your newbie and she's our newbie. <laughs> Gotta love a newbie for helping explain information. But it's interesting, and this is something that they do that you're always told not to. It's like, do not do flashbacks. But actually, a very large chunk of this first pilot is flashbacks. And I think it's actually pretty well done. I think it works because they've set all of these plot threads up in the first 10 minutes. We kind of know where things are going. We have a lot of questions. We're wondering. And then the flashbacks themselves are and very compelling and directly relate exactly to our questions in the present. So the first flashback is Laura's wedding <laughs> and that relates to conflict A which is Kate versus Laura. So we see Kate arriving late to Laura's wedding, we see tension with the mom, the mom's like if you'd been here for the fitting you wouldn't have to worry and Kate's like it's fine mom and then the mom's like Kate stop just stop and you're really getting a sense of like who these two characters are. Laura is the little sister who's never made a decision for herself her whole life. She's like the perfect child. Um, you know, the mom loves her and Kate is more of the rebel and she goes off and she does things and she stands up to her mom. We see Laura going through Kate's suitcase and then having a complete panic. And she, uh, the mother says, um, complete panic. Kate and Laura go back and see her and they're like, what do we do? And the mom says, it's nerves. Just smile through it, dear. And that's where we get our first callback because in the first 10 minutes, as Kate and Laura were boarding the plane, Kate looks at Laura and with this like kind of attitude is like, smile through it, dear. And it comes off as kind of like catty, but we actually realize it's an inside joke. She's kind of like making fun of their mom a little bit, like calling back their mom. It's like this, it's like a family tie. It's really cool to see. So we understand that earlier line. Then we get a very humorous runaway bride situation. It's a great character moment because Laura is making a decision for once in her life. That's also really well set up. And you can, you can tell from the beginning how uncertain she is versus compared to Kate. You see her at the wedding. Kate literally says she's never made a decision and we're seeing the moment she actually makes a decision. And then of course we see the moment where Laura is like, I'll become a Pan Am stewardess and Kate crushes the car. And so you get a sense of what dynamic is happening there, um, is happening in the present, which is basically Laura has invaded Kate's turf, like a lot. Um, and Kate was not prepared for it. She wasn't expecting her little sister to be there. It's very different than what she expected. In terms of other plot threads that are um, taken or carried through in this act, in our Bridget information plot, Dean puts in a request for Pan Am to locate Bridget. He calls the radio, please find her. Um, Kate double checks who her target is, um, make sure she has the right person. Colette helps John's wife like a little bit, put something, um, put a suitcase up. And then um, Ted, very early on in this act says to Dean, I don't think I'll be able to call you captain. He's like, maybe I'll start in Spanish, Capitan. And um, it's a joke, it's a joke. But I'm, again, there's this underlying tension. The underlying tension being, Ted's kind of wondering like, we were on the same level, now you're ahead of me, why? He's not totally happy with it. And it's a very interesting dynamic that we have there. Then we go to act three. In act three, we got a lot of flashbacks. So uh, the flashback is mainly, um, hold on. 
Okay, the flashback is mainly of them in Rome. In fact, this whole act is pretty much this flashback from Rome. So it starts with John coming back to talk to Colette and he says, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't know you'd be on this flight. Again, I love the, like the subtext here and because he's saying like, oh, I'm sorry, like I didn't know you'd be on the flight. And Colette says, well, I'm sorry, I didn't know you had a wife. <laughs> like that's not what you should be apologizing for, like being on the flight, wrong thing, buddy. So I love like the implicit, really good tension happening there. And it's right, you're getting everything conveyed to you without needing it to be laid out. What I love, it's great. So the guy is trying to explain himself. He's like, oh, but I didn't, and I'm, uh, I thought you understood. And then, and this is such an emotional impact, and you can tell the emotional impact that it's having on Colette when his son comes over and says, can we please see the cockpit? And so Colette is being very professional. She goes and she takes her lover's son up to the, see the pilots, and that's when we get our flashback to Rome. And the flashback really just starts with like this very covert sort of coordination of adjoining rooms. We see Colette and John walk to their rooms, open the adjoining doors between them, and then like hook up. <laughs> um, in terms of the purpose of this, I don't really know what it is because we know that they hooked up. It's very clear. And like we see that she was happy, but like nothing else really happens. Like, oh, hey, like, yeah, they definitely made out, but we already knew that they'd had sex. I don't know if it was meant to kind of show you how to be subtle or like how they had to be more subtle in the 60s, if it was meant to be more of a world building thing, or if on the other hand, it was just trying to show a contrast in the relationship and get us to Rome, because us getting to Rome is very important in this act because of the information plot about Bridget. And this is where that plot line and the spy plot line and everything is really very much built upon. Yeah, it's very much built upon. So we see Dean in Rome and we see Bridget talking to um, the person we assume is Bridget anyways. I guess we find that out once she talks to Dean, but she's talking to some guy and we realize that it's the same guy that Kate was talking to earlier and we immediately see a connection and that is a revelation. But there's this still huge amount of dramatic irony because um, Kate doesn't know that Bridget was with that guy. Dean doesn't know who that guy is or that Kate knew him. Um, and you know, we have a huge clue to what's going on that Dean does not have. Also in Rome, we see a setup between Bridget, Kate, and the guy whose name is Richard, I think. Dude, not MI6 dude, other dude. Um, so Bridget and Kate go to lunch, but Bridget bows out very quickly. You can see in the looks between Bridget and let's just call him Richard that she's lying, especially because they introduce themselves um, to each other even though they were literally just talking a couple minutes ago. So we know that there's something shady going on. Um, it's also very clever that Richard uses this lost tourist cover with Kate and Bridget gave the same excuse to Dean. Oh, I was talking to him, he was a lost tourist. As we're saying this, Richard, um, once you know Bridget leaves, Richard tells Kate that he works for US intelligence and um, he basically starts trying to recruit her. So we see the beginning of that. And Kate, as a joke, is like, oh, Stuart, this is the perfect cover, ha ha ha. And um, yeah, we understand now that she is working for what we presume is like the CIA or US intelligence anyways. In terms of our Kate versus Laura storyline, we have this little throwaway line in the Roman cafe where Kate says, my sister was the beauty queen. Richard says, someone got something backwards. And Kate says, oh, you'd have to see her. So we get a little bit more of that like sisterly tension. We understand who they were as kids. Laura was the pretty one. Kate was the more rebellious one. And at this point, um, right at the end of act two, act three, sorry, we get something very cool, which is that the plots intertwine. So the Laura versus Kate conflict and the Kate trying to get visa conflict go like this. And the 
Laura versus Kate creates complications in the trying to get the visa conflict. Basically, um, you know, Kate manages to grab the guy's passport. She puts it to the side. She's called over to help somebody else. Laura spills coffee. It almost gets on the passport. Kate's like, oh my God, she's gonna see this passport. Um, and in an attempt to cover it up, she kind of really snaps at Laura. She says, nothing is hard for you. You're perfect. Get out of my way. I do not need a lost puppy. And that tells us if we had any remaining questions about what the dynamic was between them, Laura was always the perfect child. Kate was viewed as the problem rebellious one. And um, Laura being there is, you know, Kate feels responsible for her. Kate feels like to some extent, Laura is a burden and Laura does feel like um, a burden for Kate. For Kate, she's like, Laura being here is a complication, not only as a stewardess, but we as the audience also understand the lower level, which is as like her spy job, having Laura there is not great. Then we move on to act four. And in act four, we get um, my favorite part. It really is my favorite part. So we have a tiny moment um, with our conflict C between Colette and John where the wife asks Colette to sit. They visit a little bit. Um, the son, Tommy, is drawing a picture. Um, and then the wife says, you know, I really love your eyelashes. You're blessed. I'm jealous. Um, and we're like, oh, like this, the poor wife is like so sweet. Colette is feeling so bad because she's broken up this family. Um, the wife has no idea. Oh no. And then the husband, John, is like, can you get me a drink? So he tries to get Colette out of there. He's clearly very uncomfortable with the two women speaking. Then we get a next little bit of, um, the next big bit of information from our information plot, our question, where is Bridget? We find out that Bridget resigned from the London office. This comes in over the speaker. And this is a progressive complication. And again, it's a dramatic irony type one because um, Dean is smiling and he implies that he and Bridget are engaged. She would only quit because she was going to get married. So Maggie says, congrats, blah, blah, blah. But there's still a lot of tension because because of the earlier moments where we saw Kate and Richard and Bridget together and we know about this whole spy situation in US intelligence, we know there's something else going on. So um, that is also hinted at because Sanjeet says, if you're engaged, why is, Lon why is Bridget in London? Why isn't she here? And Ted says, oh, who knows where that girl is? She barely made it on the plane in Cuba. And then we get the Cuba flashback, which I watched this scene at least once a month, I love it. I don't know what it is. I do know what it is. It's just that it's the tension is so high. The stakes are so high. And there's these like personal relationship dynamics happening at the same time. So um, we then cut to this flashback to literally like the Bay of Pigs prisoner evacuation. It, a, it gives really good context to the world um, in terms of like what is happening in the Cold War in the 60s. We see the sort of world of espionage that Kate is entering. We see the stakes because even though we know Bridget was fine, she got on the plane. Um, she's like late for the plane. We, we can see how dangerous it was for Kate. Bridget, and we know that Kate is going to take on the same role, um, and Kate is in this position. And so that builds up stakes for Kate and her safety. So we see, um, you know, Bridget was clearly doing something for the CIA, grabbing the last prisoner, um, her kind of being a mystery to Dean, and, you know, never being where he expects her to be. That's really built up. And of course, that's when on the, like, the engines roaring, the sirens are going off, and they're on this, like, the gangplank to the airplane, and Dean's like, marry me, and she says, I can't say yes now. Dean gives her these, like, airplane flying wings. And I think that's everything I wanted to say there. Oh, yes. Um, there's just a really, yeah. Yeah, that's basically the end. It's just super, um, it's super high stakes. It is super um, just really grabbing the like, Dean, I'm going to take off without you. It's like disorganized. It's panicked. Um, I love that part. And then finally, we are in act five. So in act five, we have a whole bunch of things wrap up. 
So the first one is, um, yeah, the first one is the Kate and Laura subplot. So Kate and Laura talk out, um, their issues more or less, you know, Laura's like, I'm really sorry. I'm here. I'm cramping your style. She offers to get reassigned. So she's not a burden as they're having this conversation. Kate has a brainwave and she gets Laura to bring, um, champagne to her target. And of course, the target was looking at the Life magazine, so he starts talking to Laura, creating the perfect distraction. Now, as he is talking to Laura, a couple things are happening. Number one, Kate is putting this, the passport back. Number two, we get the answer to our curiosity seed number one, which is that Laura had, been, had just graduated from stewardess school. She was crossing the street to go call her sister. She hardly remembered the photographer. It was just a candid photo and she was just happy. So we get closure here. We understand how the Life magazine came about. We even understand that, you know, Laura really loves Kate and like loves her sister. And she was happy to tell her about, um, you know, about why, um, about her graduating. She wants to be like her sister. And so, you know, it wasn't about being selected. It was just kind of random. And so all that kind of tension about like, why is the new girl on this magazine? That's resolved right there. Now, um, yes, Kate sneaks the passport back. That's our conflict B mission here. She sneaks the passport back. Um, that's all good. Then um, we get a whole bunch of reveals and revelations at the end. So I'm just going to kind of go from, let's go from the MI6 one. So after um, Kate sinks the passport back, they get to the hotel. Um, and when she opens her hotel room door, the MI6 guy, or the, the target from the plane, is sitting in her hotel room. And she is like trembling and scared until he says, I am your MI6 contact. She finds out who he is. We learn that it was actually a test. Then that veers into contributing to our information plot number three, our curiosity seed number three, where we learn that, um, well, I guess information plot number three and four, where we learn that Kate is basically replacing Bridget. And the MI6 dude sets up what she's going to be doing for the rest of the season. He says she's going to be identifying diplomats, posing um, as... Um, identifying diplomats, watching certain people crossing, and acting as a courier. And Kate has a much better understanding now of, you know, how she was recruited, why she was recruited. We have an understanding that this role is going to be maybe dangerous for Kate because Bridget's gone. We don't know what happened to Bridget. And um, we also know what she's going to be doing. So we know that this espionage threat is going to continue through the season. At the same time, um, we resolve the Colette and John thread by the wife coming back to grab her purse and she reveals she knew about the affair. So everything, that's a huge reveal because everything that happened earlier in the show is suddenly like, whoa, she knew all along, craziness. Um, the line that was like, oh, you're blessed, I'm jealous, takes on a new meaning when you realize she knew that Colette was sleeping with her husband. And then she says something, um, you know, like probably somewhat justified, but like a little petty because it's not Colette's fault. It's the husband's fault. But she says, um, you know, keep this picture, keep her son's picture, put it on your fridge as a reminder not to sleep with other women's husbands. So that happens. Um, it's a big reveal for us. It doesn't seem to affect Colette too much. She's like, okay, moving on. Um, so it doesn't have a lot of staying power. In fact, Colette, I think in this entire series has the least like through line, through line because she's with John and then she kind of has a romance with Dean and then she has a romance with the prince and then there, she learns about her family. She's the least linear, I think, character, the least kind of obvious and proactive in like what she wants and consistent in what she wants. And then of course we get to our final big question, which is kind of framing like the mystery of Bridget and the consequences of her disappearance, which shapes the rest of the season. 
although not quite as tightly as I think they could have done. Um, but anyways, Dean tries to call Bridget. The line was disconnected. He goes to her apartment. It's empty. He finds the wings. She left them there. She's saying no to his proposal. She's gone. Um, she's completely gone. And that is, doesn't really answer where is Bridget, but it's certainly a, a, an ending point for that arc. And then we get to this nice, t t kind, um, nice time kind of at the end. So remember in act two, when Ted was, you know, Ted and Dean has have this power imbalance and Ted is not calling Dean captain. Uh, but then they're sitting at the bar after, you know, Dean can't find Bridget, they're drinking. Dean, Ted is saying, you know, if Bridget was predictable, you'd lose interest. Dean expresses some sadness. And then Ted is finally like, with the power balance a little bit more restored, like they're friends, Dean is confiding in him. Um, you know, he's in a sad, sad point. Ted very deliberately is like, you did a great job and he called him captain. And that's a big moment. Again, another like really nice circular callback. Although, of course, this thread actually continues for a bit through the series, um, and it really evolves into Ted's character arc, so it's pretty cool. And then we really get towards the end. So our kind of last couple minutes here, Bridget's staring through the window at them looking very sad, so we know she's not dead. And Ted, in somewhat of a like sexist, misogynistic way, but that's also kind of nice, so it was probably relevant to the time period, is like, these women aren't like normal women. It's natural selection at work. Um, they have an impulse to take flight. And Kate talks to Laura and she says, hey, you're gonna be great at this. And um, when Laura says, you know, I can never live up to that picture, Kate says, no, 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 no. You don't have to live up to it because it's not just you, it's all of us. It's look what we represent. Look at this new era, this sense of beginning and freshness and newness. And then our closing image is a little girl looking up in awe at the stewardesses, just like the little boy did at the beginning looking at the pilots. So it's kind of this like, oh, age of the modern woman type thing going on there, which is pretty cool. We have a lot of plots that are very much like power status struggles here. Um, you know, you have a lot of power reversals. And I think that's why it, it makes it so interesting. Like the, the reversal of the wife knowing about the fair, that's a big power shift, right? Um, the Ted and Dean is power shift. Kate and Laura, like newbie, sister, supportive, not supportive. There's a big power shift there. So to summarize, I am going to go through each of the plot threads and do the desire, endpoint, opponent, plan, conflict, and twist reveal for them as a summary, and then we're going to wrap it up. All of this, of course, can be found at my website. You can just download it. There's no, you don't have to sign up for anything, but if you want access to the Google Sheet, there it is. So, here we are. The plot thread of Kate versus Laura. Wants to be a good so the desire she wants to Laura live up to her image in the Life magazine, and she wants to be really good at her job, like her sister. Um, her opponent is Kate. Kate is critical of her and Laura is also her own opponent because she's like very uncertain and doesn't really know what she's doing. Her plan is to just like freaking ignore the Life magazine and just try her best. The conflict is she doesn't have the skills yet and everyone keeps bringing the Life magazine up. Kate gets really annoyed with her. Our twist is the photo in the magazine was a total fluke. Um, and then the end point, Kate tells Laura she's going to be a great stewardess and Laura gains some confidence. In terms of Kate's mission, her desire is to switch the visas in the passport. Her opponent is the target, the guy. The conflict, or her plan is to use her job as a stewardess to get access to that passport. The conflict is the guy is like very troublesome, won't let her take any of his things. Um, he's, you know, being very observant and the other stewardesses kind of get in the way. She has to avoid them so they don't know what she's doing, um, hide her things. She's being like very covert and kind of flustered. The twister reveal is that the target was actually her MI6 handler and it was a test. The other kind of reveal is that she is Bridget's replacement. And the end point is, you know, she succeeded, but she found out that she is Bridget's replacement. And that sets up a lot of like questions and potential tension for what kind of danger she might be in in the future. The next plot thread is Colette and John and the wife who I don't think whose name I don't think we ever learned so I don't like calling her the wife but she doesn't have a name so. 
Um, this one was a little bit, I said that Colette, like, is hard to know what she wants throughout this whole series. I think that's really reflected here. So, Colette originally wants to be with John, but then about eight minutes in, we see that he's married. And so then, I don't know what she wants, like, just to kind of get through the flight, more or less. Um, to feel better? I don't know. Um, her opponent, I think, is John, but the hidden opponent is the wife. Her plan is to just do her job. <laughs> um, and not, you know, not go easy on him, but do her job, act normally. The conflict is Colette has to serve her lover's wife and his son and kind of see what she theoretically disrupted. The twister reveal is that the wife knew all along and at the end, she's like super okay with it. She's like, ah, next time. So the plot doesn't really go anywhere. That's the one that I don't, I don't love. I don't know what we, I don't, I don't know what they're doing with Colette. I feel like it didn't, it didn't pay off because at the end she's literally like, ah, okay, I'm fine. And it doesn't super relate to the other themes here. Like we have this, um, the other plot threads, as we'll see with like Kate versus Laura, like Laura wanting to do well, Kate's mission, even like Dean trying to get Bridget to say yes to him. There's very much like a success failure value shift there. Like we're seeing when Laura makes mistakes, we're, we're watching Kate do things well, we're like waiting for Dean to figure out what's going on. And with Colette, it's not really a success failure. It's just like a, like a withstand this awkward situation. If you have any thoughts on that, I would love to hear them because I don't really know what to do with it. And then of course, there is uh, the Dean Bridget with like a side of Ted. Um, Cause even though like that, I would say that that tension is a thread. It, there's no real desire there at this point. So it's Dean's desire that's really driving things, which is Dean wants to marry Bridget. Um, his opponent is Bridget. His plan is to find out where Bridget is. <laughs> The conflict is he's having a hard time getting the information. Bridget is not talking to him. And also at the same time, Ted, Ted presents like some tension to his position as pilot. And it's kind of like, eh, me, me. the twister reveal is that um, Bridget was a spy and now she's gone. Although Dean does not know that she was a spy or that she's permanently gone. And the end point is Bridget has disappeared and um, Dean is not with her, but Ted, you know, kind of offers some friendship. Wow. I just talked straight for 45 minutes. I am not editing this thing. This is so long. Uh, but I will link the um, the Google Sheet where you can get it below as well as the episode. Tell me your thoughts. Do you like this? A, do you like the style video where we analyze things in depth? B, um, do you think in terms of plot threads, plot lines, anything like that? I really like tracing both the questions, the curiosity seeds, and the sources of conflict. I think it's useful to separate those out, even though there's, you know, obviously some overlap. So when you have like your subplots, your plot lines, like how do you kind of define them? Do you have any categories, that kind of thing? And have you seen Pan Am? <laughs> have you watched the rest of the episodes? Because I love this show and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. So thank you so much for watching. I am Nicole Wilbur. If you liked this, make the YouTube, make the YouTube gods happy with the likes and the subscribes. My mouth is literally so dry right now. I have to drink my wine. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.